Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this Open Group webinar on the Open Group Service Integration Maturity Model, the OSIM. I'm Chris Harding. I'm the Forum Director for SOA in the Open Group, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar. This will not be a straightforward tutorial on the OSIM. We've already run one of those, and the recording is available if you want to uh, understand the OSIM at that level. The intention of this webinar is to answer people's questions on how the OSIM works in practice, uh, and we are fortunate in having uh, to assist us with this. Um, Andras Shakal, who is an expert on the OSIM, he is a distinguished engineer with IBM, and he was uh, heavily involved in the initial development of the OSIM uh, and has been further involved in maturity assessments. Um, and we also have Dan Starkovich of Raytheon, and he will be coming to this with the perspective of a user of the OSIM, and he has some questions that he will be asking Andras uh, that Andras will be answering. But uh, the questions we hope will not just come from Dan. Um, everyone is invited to put their questions to Andras in this webinar, everyone who is online. Uh, and if you wish to do so, the way to do it is by using the Q&A facility and to address your question to all so that all, all the participants in the webinar can see what the questions are. Uh, so this will be an excellent way of getting into the OSIM in depth. Um, to start it off, though, Andras is going to give us a brief 10-minute overview of what the OSIM is, uh, and once he has done that, we will get into Q&A mode. So without further ado, uh, I will now hand over to Andras to tell us what is the OSIM. All right, thanks, Chris, uh, and thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to uh, Dan's participation and uh, everybody's uh, uh, further interest in, in helping uh, the industry adopt the uh, OSIM model. Uh, just to remind you, OSIM stands for the uh, Open Service Integration Maturity Model. So the first thing we should say is that it, this is uh, not quite like any other uh, maturity model. It is, uh, you know, a, a maturity model per se. Um, but it, 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 it is extensible, and uh, we'll go through that in a second. Also, too, it's not about SOA per se. It's about service integration, and uh, we intentionally tried to stay away from the word SOA because we believe that uh, SOA was, uh, you know, obviously going to change in its uh, maturation and point of view, and we didn't want to be tied you know, necessarily directly to, you know, a particular point of view on technology. Uh, likewise, we didn't call it cloud either, but you could, you know, really, um, you know, kind of interchangeably use the word cloud and so uh, uh, in most cases. Uh, it is a, a service integration maturity model, so it's how well um, you've adopted a, a, a point of view according to the OSIM framework and um, where you're going potentially. Uh, and, and provides you with a path for getting there. It's an extensible maturity framework. That is that uh, you can fill it up with uh, uh, your own uh, contributions, and we'll see how that kind of works as we move forward. And uh, it, it's a pr process for maturity assessments, so it helps you define the overarching process. Let me go on here. Uh, the other um, elements that uh, OSIM focuses on is uh, understanding how the business and the IT domain uh, play together uh, to achieve a, a, a business objective. So we define our current state and we're reaching for a future state that actually tracks very well with both of our um, IT and business strategies, right? So how do we realize those two in tandem or how can one support the other? Obviously IT must support business. Uh, and, they're, and that's done so uh, in, using the dimensions across the OSIM model, the applications method, uh, the information model, the operations, the architecture, um, and influenced by the governance and organization. So um, uh, OSIM doesn't suggest a big bang approach. OSIM is all about evolutionary approach uh, to reaching the, your future desired state. 
So obviously your enterprise architecture and your and your incremental uh, approaches are, are very important in, in in using OSIM. OSIM is not something you use once and just put it down. OSIM is something uh, that is useful, uh, kind of uh, in stages uh, to assess where you know where you are uh, today with respect to the maturity matrix and um, how far you've gotten. Um, and the progress that you've uh, achieved. So, you know, here is the ubiquitous OSIM maturity matrix. This is the 7x7 seven seven, uh, model that uh, shows the maturity levels um, and the domains. The domains are on the uh, vertical and uh, 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 across the horizontal, I'm sorry. Um, you know, we have the business view, the organization, and governance, the methods, the applications, the architecture and the information uh, domain, and the infrastructure and management domain. Now, intersecting those are the uh, maturity levels. We call these level one through seven, but we also gave them a name. Don't get too, you know, married to the name. Uh, we try to make them as generic and descriptive as possible. Uh, but for example, you know, you could. Pretty much see cloud computing begin to evolve in the uh, later, you know, stages of the maturity model. Um, that was, uh, you know, certainly something we did intentionally, in so much as that we were we were beginning to see uh, the advent of cloud when we started working SOA, and uh, certainly cloud computing is an important element of uh, everybody's uh, lexicon today. But you really have to think of it in terms of service integration because you need a service platform. You need to be able to actually connect to um, your existing systems uh, and create service components. Uh, you have to externalize services. You, be, you have to in, implement um, composite services. You have to be able to virtualize those. Um, and then ultimately, uh, the OSIM matrix talks about uh, the dynamically reconfigurable services, that is, uh, those services that uh, whose composition um, are not strictly tied to a static point in time, but actually are dynamically responding to um, business uh, changes, or technical changes for that matter. So uh, we also have this uh, concept in the maturity matrix of the service foundation levels. These are, you know, the uh, re kind of baseline technical requirements for achieving services. And you know, we a lot of folks have said, well, why did, why, you know, why didn't you just remove those? Well, um, fact of the matter is that even with uh, existing SOA projects in place, um, existing systems have to be extended. Um, value has to be extracted. We're seeing a lot of uh, acquisitions and mergers still. Um, consolidation across business objectives, and you know, really, those take almost a very greenfield integration approach to extracting the business value. So you still have to kind of go through this, or you still have the situation where you have siloed systems or siloed data that needs to be integrated and extended, componentized, and ultimately used in services. So we think it's uh, still very important to have the service foundation layers called out because, you know, the, you, you need to realize that there's this constant evolutionary approach to extracting the business value through services out of your, your uh, infrastructure and business processes. Uh, just to kind of call out, um, the uh, domain, a, a domain example here we have, for example, uh, in this particular uh, chart, um, the, uh, uh, let's see, level five. Uh, if we go back up here to the uh, maturity matrix, we see that level five is composite services. Uh, and uh, we have a, a set of fundamental attributes in order to actually be considered uh, a level five maturity. And we have a set of evolving attributes. And what we are uh, trying to do is, is make sure that the OSIM tracks with our future published uh, SOARA. And so we've uh, done some tweaking there over the life uh, span of OSIM to make sure that it tracks very well with uh, what we're about to, the, to publish with respect to the SOARA. And we're going to make some updates to the SOARA as we go forward. I mean. Uh, OSIM to make sure that it, it tracks with the naming conventions defined in the SOARA as we go forward, like the use of uh, architectural building blocks. Um, 
But if you look at the, uh, you know, the SOARA model, which we've published some of this uh, already, um, just to let everybody know where we are, and we intend to, you know, publish the entire SOARA this year. Um, the the business processes are, are really, um, and business process optimization and business process management shows up um, as we move from uh, level six. Uh, I'm sorry, level five to level six. And uh, this is an example of where we can actually integrate um, the SOA RA into our lexicon uh, uh, for um, OSIM. But uh, in this case, we have a set of fundamental attributes, like, for example, the need to have uh, a services registry and repository. Uh, business processes are becoming composite. Uh, ESB is common. Um, we're doing transformation and integration. Uh, and service advertising uh, through the ESB, uh, use of uh, BPIL uh, and BPM to define business services, and uh, common security services uh, and the policy model behind them are uh, a, an integral baseline requirement. Evolving attributes may be the master data model um, and a master data model, uh, an MDM service, an operational virtualization service, uh, which is evolving. Uh, we have uh, continued uh, you know, maturity in the SOA process uh, monitoring and management um, capabilities so that we can provide insight into both our business processes, the activities that are actually being conducted in the business process itself, as well as the technical aspects. And then we have an, an evolving integrated identity management and security policy management model. So at, at this time, now that I've done that flyby, I'd like to hand it over to Dan, and we can start the process of uh, asking questions and really get, getting down into nitty gritties. Uh, thanks, Andres. Uh, great overview, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone online. Point out that, uh, Andres, we're already starting to get questions from the attendees, so I'll um, uh, weave my own questions into the ones we're getting from the attendees, if that's okay. Um, so one question I had, Andres, was with regard to applying the model, uh, the OSIM model. Have you uh, identified or observed anything, any best, what you would consider to be best practices in putting the model to use? Oh, absolutely. All right. So let's not forget, and I'm going to, you know, come on down here uh, to the uh, – assessment mind map, which you can uh, actually get a copy of this presentation. Some, most of this presentation is online from our webinar that we've already done on SOA, uh, I mean on OSIM. And um, just like, uh, you know, you have the old saying, uh, the old adage with respect to buying real estate, you know, it's all location, location, location. Well, with, with OSIM, it's all about preparation, preparation, preparation. So, you know, you, you, you know, obviously you got to spend some time understanding the model, but you, you really need uh, that prep time to load the model so that you have the right um, maturity indicators uh, and, and, the, and the framework set up uh, that is aligned to your EA and SOA strategy so that when you go in and uh, you prompt, uh, you, you go through the process of interviewing um, or uh, data discovery, that you find the right information, that it leads you to the correct assumptions with respect to the maturity levels that you're marking on. And, um, uh, you know, OSIM is really a way, a great way to actually make sure that everybody understands your corporate, you know, strategy with respect to the service integration and services models. Uh, and, and so this is a way that you can actually get the perspective of individuals from you know the infrastructure guys all the way up through the business uh, analysts who understand you know where their vision is, um, but it may not track necessarily with the strategy and may impact really where you are from a maturity point of view. So uh, I'd say preparation is extremely important. All right. Uh, any other best practices that you've observed? Particularly, if we have one question from the floor, Andres, which is interesting, is with regard to, say, convincing uh, senior levels of management that the OSIM is a good tool to help construct a roadmap. Well, I, you know, I look, I, I love SOA. I'm a techie as much as any uh, of the individuals in this uh, webinar. I'm also an executive uh, and a VP. 
And v, you know, once you get to that level, they don't really care about what tools you're using. They want to know what the outcomes are, what the indicators are. So, you know, telling somebody that you're going to use OSIM is great. Really explaining the value that it's going to bring is more important. So, you know, what you're trying to do is to be inclusive, uh, and you're trying to make sure that you evolve so that you realize the business value and the return on the investment the company or organization is putting into implementing a service infrastructure and a service model. So that, that I think, is, you know, the approach I would take when talking to executives versus talking to technical folks who probably want to know a little bit more about the nuts and bolts about how this was, is going to work. Now, also, too, your presentation is going to be really important. So if, if they say, fine, I don't care whatever tool you use, right, um, how you present the results is going to be equally as important as using the model. And if you make it too busy um, or if you suggest that, you know, there are too many problems, that could, that could be an issue all in of itself. So some of this is about executive presentation. Some of this is actually about doing the right um, work with respect to crafting uh, the results. And the other part is actually pitching the value of, of OSIM. Great. Thanks, Andres. Um, another question was with regard to um, whether or not the OSIM model has drawn from or leveraged the uh, SCI maturity model or the CMMI uh, maturity models that are there. Is there a relationship there? Is, is this leverage some of that work? So um, we've had this question in the past, and let me uh, kind of preface it by saying that uh, in my uh, previous company, um, one of my responsibilities was uh, to actually help the company evolve to um, CMM level three uh, and, you know, heading towards four and understanding the SEI maturity models uh, and, and, and kind of culturally approaching uh, transformation uh, using those models as tools. All these models are tools. Um, it's, it's really in how you actually apply the tools and whether you're focused more on the tool than you are on the practice, which is, you know, a, uh, and not a best practice, certainly, yeah. something that you should avoid. Um, so uh, uh, my, my uh, feeling is that um, I've seen, you know, a couple of customers use um, the uh, capability maturity model uh, in conjunction with OSIM to arrive at a um, repeatable you know, process for implementing um, service integration across their portfolio. So I really see that, you know, for example, CMM or CMMI might be um, a kind of broader perspective on end-to-end -end IT um, process integration than OSIM, which is very, very focused on, you know, achieving certain specific goals around service integration. So you certainly could use both at the same time. Sure. And let me just build on that a little bit. Have you uh, had some observations or experiences that you could share with us with regard to using the OSIM in conjunction with um, some structured architecture models, such as TOGAF, for example, or DODAF or Zachman approaches? Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, let me run through here and uh, try to find the chart that I'm looking for. Oh, there it is. Uh, so, look, um, TOGEF and Zachman are uh, tools, again, just like any tool. Um, Zachman focuses on EA model perspectives and EA taxonomy, whereas TOGEF takes a more evolutionary life cycle approach uh, and, a, uh, and service taxonomy approach. Um, so I would say that uh, from a Zachman point of view, um, OSIM would help you load the different, um, you know, model perspectives uh, as an as a as an evolutionary outcome of uh, the assessment, and that um, you know I think Zachman and Togaf both talk about you know an evolutionary approach, right? So again, OSIM is not about you know doing the assessment once and then putting it aside. It's about doing the assessment probably, let's say, you know, quarterly and, and helping load the current as-is models into 
um, both our TOGAF and our Zachman perspective. But, you know, with respect to TOGAF, you know, I think of it as uh, kind of integrated into the ADM. And so you may, you may actually do an OSIM assessment and its outcomes are then used in the different crop circles, for example, as part of architecture vision, as part of business architecture, you know, the business process perspectives, the, the results and the, the data that you harvest there would influence um, your TOGEF decisions. Uh, and of course, the IT and infrastructure pieces would influence uh, phase C, and ultimately then you would move into implementation. And once you got back around to the top and you were doing another rev, Maybe it's not uh, another opportunity for you to uh, for you to conduct another OSIM assessment. Great. So um, one of the um, features I think of the OSIM model is um, that it not only provides you a starting point, but also a, a framework and some encouragement to um, customize the model for your particular industry or use. Um, I was wondering whether or not um, you had some um, experience with customizing the uh, OSIM model for a particular industry and uh, any recommendations on how to go about uh, carrying out that customization and defining maturity criteria uh, with, with the customized uh, maturity indicators. Right. Yeah. So the customization of OSIM is extremely important. You know, both from uh, the uh, the the creating the proper indicators and the attributes uh, that you're looking for, um, but also to the uh, assessment questions that would lead you to um, harvest the right data so that you can make a decision about. Um, the measurements that you're going to make. So, in other words, the measure, the specific measurement that you make is really um, the the data leads you to uh, define uh, maturity level according to the maturity indicators defined by the maturity attributes, right, um, or the you know, the characteristics. Uh, so. Um, in the uh, last webinar, we actually went through the case study for DDB uh, and um, the fact that they had adopted uh, Mimosa and uh, were using the, um, the, the, the Mimosa and the OA, oops, uh, OSA EAI architecture uh, as a foundation, um, you know, kind of enterprise architecture perspective for for uh, solving some of their problems. And uh, we really went through the process of creating uh, new maturity indicators, attributes, uh, and the assessment. So go and, and actually dive into that webinar. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, uh, I, I, you know, Heather, uh, um, myself, and, 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 and Dan and others, you know, Chris can help facilitate questions back to the group if you have any. Uh, about actually conducting those, um, that process of creating the uh, the indicators and assessments, because uh, I think really you know it, it's really important to sit back and look at you know a what your uh, enterprise architecture is, what your strategic objectives are, um, both from a technical and business point of view, and craft um, well-formed maturity indicators. And if you look at what we've done in IBM with the uh, so assessment tool, um, we actually have a tool, and I'm, we're not the only company that has one, by the way, um, that gathers all this information and allows you to actually modify the framework and automate the process of conducting the assessment. Um, so you might want to, you know, either create your own tool or go, you know, get involved with a company that has a tool, because I think these are all very important, you know, kind of um, supporting uh, uh, capabilities that allow you to actually conduct the right OSIM uh, assessment. Safe to say, though, Andres, that uh, in developing customizations along with uh, maturity indicators, that the uh, approach starts with understanding the strategic uh, objectives of the organization and then decomposing those into the technical architecture. Would that be fair? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you certainly can have 
uh, a technical approach to implementing the SOA infrastructure that, you know, can be um, a separate initiative from, you know, your business objectives because there's some foundational requirements that have to be, you know, uh, operationalized in order to actually instantiate the business processes. But the two have to come together and the two must support each other. And you don't invest in IT without understanding the out, uh, the return on investment, right? So, you know, there there are quite a few, um, and if we go over here to the SOA, you know, SOA services or what we call architectural building blocks that pertain to each one uh, of the um, layers in the, uh, in the RA and ultimately to uh, the uh, correspond to the maturity levels, and you're not going to need all of these. You know, the, some it really depends on uh, the uh, business requirements, the services that need to be externalized, and the quality of services and policies that have to be implemented and put in place. So um, you need, your business must drive certainly your IT investment. Um, there are some basics, though. Right. That said. Um, having a service registry repository is very important. Having that application server integrated with that so registry and repository is, is important. Having the this security in place to be able to manage policies is is a you know foundational requirement. Um, uh, so there are some some base requirements out there that are necessary to actually realize SOA that you could be um, putting in place in advance of the business, but ultimately you're not going to make that investment unless you know the return on, uh, on value. Yeah. We, um, as an aside, I'll, I'll um, point out that we have had some questions about um, whether we have a list of maturity indicators and waiting for those during evaluation. And if, if uh, for those on the call who have that question, I would refer you to the OSIM specification which is available from the Open Group website. And in the specification has a list of uh, initial maturity indicators for each of these levels and weights that are associated with them. Again, I'd, I'd point out, as Andres has shown here, um, that um, uh, these are available in the technical standard and they're you know, positioned as a starting point uh, there's lots of encouragement in the standard for you to um, to uh, customize the OSIM model for your particular use. Um, Andres um, had a couple of questions here, one of my own and one from the from the uh, seminar here about um, the scope uh, that we're concerned with when applying the OSIM model. As we discussed before, and my experience, um, on the one hand, you can certainly apply the OSIM model to your own enterprise to assess where you are in a maturity process, a maturity uh, level with regard to realizing systems integration. On the other hand, you can also, um, it seems, uh, apply the model to a target customer organization to help them assess their readiness, for example, to uh, accept a software or system delivery that uh, integrates their systems. So have you seen the model used in that, uh, those two types of applications and uh, any observations or comments about using it in those two ways? Yeah, I mean, we have done um, actually hundreds of uh, uh, OSIM assessments, and uh, the two um, areas which they impact the most is in uh, making uh, business strategic business decisions and then determining the um, uh, the readiness of the uh, team that will be doing the implementation of the SOA infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's really impactful um, from a point of view of being able to help you kind of understand um, and what are the, you know, kind of moving pieces and parts and do you have the right skills and infrastructure necessary to ba basically realize um, your enterprise uh, architecture, strategy, and vision. 
And the other one obviously is helping projects understand, you know, the needed investment. You know, where are they today? Where, you know, where do they believe they are going? And what are the steps that they ha have to take, the evolutionary steps that they need to take in order to get there? So, um, you know, you, I think you, we talked about this before, you and I, and you really kind of brought up a point that I hadn't thought a lot about, but being able to kind of assess yourself or assess a group of individuals on their ability to be able to actually implement uh, services, uh, in, uh, cloud computing slash SOA, um, and their technical skills, I think is a really um, excellent way to, to, to utilize the model. You probably would need to update the maturity indicators and the attributes to help align with um, some of those activities, but then that's what it's here for. That's right. So let me build on that a little bit, Andres, um, um, with regard to scope. Um, how would you extend the OSIM model to, I think, what we'd call in TOGAF an extended enterprise architecture or, you know, an architecture that is uh, federated across partners and suppliers that each have their own, say, enterprise architecture? How would you uh, use the OSIM in an environment like that? Well, I think in that case you really have to think in terms of service um, interoperability as well as integration. So. Um, you, your your architectural objectives have to be um, reflected in the uh, in the setup for an, o, uh, an OSIM assessment if it's going to be useful. So how do the how are the partners going to integrate their business services across a value chain is going to be something that you're going to have to have a handle on. And um, you know in that case it's going to have to be focused on you know uh, understanding the business processes and the business outcomes and uh, ensuring that you're able to actually. Um, measure, uh, you know, the, uh, those processes so you understand um, what what is success and what is not, uh, you know, <laughs> a value, and and it's going to be less maybe based on um, so infrastructure, right? So you may have to change some of the uh, the indicators to be able to support that. That's a that's a really interesting, um, you know, idea of using it. Uh, to to actually help uh, a business um, you know ecosystem a value chain understand whether or not they're effectively approaching uh, service integration correctly. Um, so uh, I think it would be you know obviously you would have to define an overarching strategy for each of the partners to follow with respect to service uh, externalization and. Um, and then you would have to uh, uh, establish a set of maturity indicators and attributes and the proper weighting to, for them to be able to uh, assess their um, maturity against those objectives. Hmm. So, um, thanks, Andres. Um, we also have a series, I'd say uh, two or three questions that I'm going to group together that address um, what I would characterize as some of the cultural issues uh, with uh, regarding moving an organization from a um, wherever they're at to a more uh, mature service integrated organization. And I was wondering if you could comment from your experience on using the OSIM as a tool to um, not only guide and direct but encourage uh, the cultural transformations uh, that are required in an organization? Yeah, I, I, w I would agree 100%, and I'm going to go back over here to the uh, tutorial and, and, the, and the tooling example here. Um, uh, and let me uh, go ahead and pop up here to uh, the process. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in my mind, OSIM uh, in a customer engagement at atmosphere where I'm, in, you know, either internally consulting uh, across uh, development teams or with the customers trying to understand, all right, so I have a need to implement services. I want to create, you know, a service environment for you and Raytheon that would be uh, potentially uh, uh, a mission-oriented service environment. Um, which has a certain set of uh, you know, quality attributes, um, quality service attributes that are necessary to meet, as well as business processes, for example. 
Uh, and, you know, it's very much an assessment of that organization's ability to understand their own strategy. So, you know, there's the, there's the framework set up, which, you know, you have to work with the customer on uh, or the target organization to actually create, you know, the, to, to populate the framework with the right uh, maturity indicators and attributes uh, just from the start. Uh, and, and in doing that, I found that uh, you you can glean a significant amount of information uh, across the organization about different perspectives, you know, and competing perspectives. Uh, and it brings people together. I mean, I've I've had you know a tremendous uh, number of examples where we have customers come in, and you get different perspectives from different business leaders. Uh, and the IT department versus the business analyst, and you get them put in the room, and nobody has ever done that before. And they're put in the same room, and they're asked, you know, to help answer some of these questions that um, we come up with in the SOA assessment, and agree on together as a team their maturity levels, and uh, and how you might actually go about meeting uh, the requirements to evolve to their envisioned goals. And it's a, it's just a fantastic um, set, you know magic that occurs when you finally force people together, and um, and create a shared vision. So getting everyone into the same framework, talking about the same issues, using is, the same uh, lexicon, yeah, is really important. Significant step forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what a couple of questions with regard to um, other say emerging maturity models. I know that in the uh, energy management community, for example, uh, several efforts to develop a smart grid maturity model. Someone's pointed out also, uh, Stephen Amsbury pointed out, there's also uh, healthcare maturity models that are emerging uh, and also leveraging uh, SCI. Have you, uh, uh, had a chance to look at those or been exposed to those, and is there, um, do you see overlap between uh, OSIM and these other, uh, particularly in the smart grid and healthcare areas, these maturity models there? Um, yeah, I see some overlap. I mean, but they're, you know, trying to evolve or define them, your uh, maturity with respect to already a predefined set of industry strategies, right? So yeah. if, uh, if, if your industry is uh, basically been, let's say, um, uh, required by policy or law to go in a particular direction. Some of these industry models are quite useful. In general, most of these maturity models, with the exception of CMM and SEI, you know, so on and so forth, the, you know, the OSIMs of the world, they're really in disguise trying to um, help you achieve the implementation of an industry framework. And that industry framework is either managed by a consortia or a set of companies who are, you know, have a goal in mind. <laughs> um, and obviously the goal is to achieve, um, you know, industry adoption of their perspectives and technologies. So OSIM is a little broader. You can use all of these in the context of OSIM. OSIM might, you know, be your conscience that helps you understand, you know, that not every, you know, every, um, you know, uh, requirement policy, um, enterprise architecture uh, uh, directive is necessarily um, going to lead you down to a more mature service uh, uh, slash cloud slash SOA environment. Um, they may actually require you to become more stovepiped in some cases. And you may realize that through the adoption of, of OSIM as a practice culturally. So would it be, um, uh, how would I say it, safe or a um, reasonable approach, I think, to use the uh, um, industry-specific maturity models as a source of information to, say, expand and specialize the OSIM for a particular industry? Yeah, I mean, look, mm -hmm. all of these models are tools, yep. and tools are only successful in, you know, when you have somebody who actually understands how to effectively apply them, right? And any tool can be misused. So, um, you know, the, the industry models are intended to help uh, industry partners integrate and uh, rally around a set of 
perspectives and requirements. Um, and the OSIM is really more about, you know, a, a, a being able to measure your adoption of service integration across your infrastructure and enforcing some of this, you know, re, uh, uh, group decision making around how you might actually achieve some of your objectives. So, you know, in a way, it, it, it has some attributes that are very similar to EA. Um, but if you say EA to people, they sometimes, you know, get all choked up, right? And and by actually conducting an OSIM assessment, you may actually, uh, you may be able to glean um, data that can help populate your enterprise architecture model. Mm -hmm. um, Andres, I had, uh, we had discussed briefly, and I, I haven't sent it to you yet, but promised I would, that uh, there was uh, um, U.S. government, uh, U.S. Air Force had uh, issued a request for information, and in that request for information, they used the OSIM maturity model um, and referenced it and asked the respondents to uh, assess themselves against that uh, against the OSIM. Mm -hmm. Do you know where else the OSIM is being uh, adopted? Uh, by uh, procurement agencies or uh, industries? Uh, well, I have quite a few customers that have used it, and unfortunately, you know, just like EA frameworks, they don't really want anybody else to know that they're using it. Mm -hmm. so let's just say that we've had um, thousands of folks, you know, download and use our tools or engage the services team on them, uh, and uh, so I see a broad adoption of OSIM. I see uh, the public sector um, adopting OSIM um, and using it in assessments uh, across the military space and the um, civilian space. Uh, and, and it's funny because you know sometimes they come to IBM or they come to a you know a Capgemini or others that have uh, you know the tooling. They use it you know for the first time you know they they you know they they hire the, the consultant and then they culturally adopt it internally with. Um, and, and come up there with their own tools, their own perspectives, and it begins to have a life of their own. And, you know, you certainly, you know, obviously, you know, I don't want to suggest that you lose uh, the ability to have traction with a customer after that as a consultant, but, um, you know, you much rather have the customer adopt, uh, you know, OSIM um, broadly and culturally and make it part of their DNA than to constantly be trying to explain to them that, you know, well, the reason why this project <laughs> failed uh, was because you didn't do the due diligence that led up to making some of the decisions about how you were going to externalize some of your services or implement the infrastructure or the, you know, how you were going to segment your business processes. Yes. Yep. Um, so with the wide use of OSIM uh, and the feedback that uh, you're gathering as well as other practitioners. Where do you see OSIM going in the future? Well, like I said, we're very much looking forward to Ali Asanjani and, uh, and the other folks on the SOARA team finishing up the SOARA. Um, I want to take uh, another pass at uh, the OSIM specification and make sure that it's up to date with respect to terminology used in the SOARA. I want to come up with logical models that track with the ABB definitions. Um, I want to, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do with OSIM was to create a repository which you, the, you know, the, the technical um, experts could, um, you know, provide input into as examples of using OSIM and, um, you know, create new maturity indicators and contribute them like as open source. Um, you know, we've been doing so many of these, uh, you know, webinars and outreach, uh, you know, engagements and uh, e even personal engagements with, uh, you know, uh, companies uh, to explain to them the value of OSIM. Uh, you know, it's it, 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 it's been a little bit exhausting over the last few years, but, you know, I think we've gotten to the point where now um, we've got, uh, an, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, a a group of companies have adopted OSIM and they're willing to probably help with some of these new maturity indicators and, and externalize them as as open source. And that's really where I would like to see op, uh, OSIM go is, you know, here is some of the uh, maturity indicators and the uh, attributes and this is the assessment roadmap that I used and 
um, this is the value that I got from it. And you can actually take it up at a, le a level and not, you know, basically, um, you know, disclose all of your corporate strategy, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, this would probably be very true with respect to the public sector where, you know, most of the work is done in the open anyway. So, um, you know, those are the areas that I'm looking to, you know, help push the adoption of OSIM and mature OSIM in general. Um, and I'm, I'm really very much looking forward to the adoption of the SOARA and, and creating logical representations at each maturity level. Could you, um, in your slides there, go back to the uh, kind of the maturity grid? Sure. Well, actually, let me uh, go ahead and uh, well, yeah, that's okay. One here. Yep. Yeah, so this that's is fine. the so, um, roadmap. Um, um, has a few questions with regard to um, the position of uh, cloud computing in here. Obviously, the model is. While not dependent on SOA, cognizant of SOA, uh, would you see um, how would you see cloud working itself into here? Would it be so? Soul, now you've got me slash... passionate, I think, because you know I uh, I have to say that I'm not a huge fan of saying the word cloud. I mean, you can say cloud, but what does it mean? It's like saying the history of computing. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, my feeling is um, I, I, I'm going to take a different perspective on your first point about cloud not being SOA. Cloud is, um, you know, uh, certainly um, at its core service-oriented, right? And OSIM is about service integration, so it's the ability to actually realize services uh, and business process management uh, and the instantiation of your business processes into those services and the ability to ultimately um, dynamically configure uh, as changing business dynamics uh, occur those business processes and that's that's really you know if you were to think about this in terms of its core elements mm -hmm. you you would probably find the definition of cloud in there. So virtualization, service integration, um, uh, the the focus on you know master data management, uh, infrastructure virtualization, as well as governance. All of these things are all part of cloud computing or part of some instantiated implementation of of some service model which you are calling cloud. I mean, I know a lot of companies that went took a look at their portfolio and said, well. All right, we'll just rename it, you know. Right, um, right. Mm -hmm. And they were already doing, to a, a great degree, you know, s service oriented computing. Um, I think the big difference between cloud computing and basic SOA is this idea of being able to, um, you know, kind of commoditize a particular service and, and have a grid computing uh, approach that allows you to kind of pay. Ber pay by the SIP, you know, via utility computing model of some sort. That doesn't make sense in all cases. In fact, I would say in most business processes, uh, it doesn't make sense. And I think that we're coming to a conclusion that, you know, hey, there is uh, some realistic approaches to cloud computing that service orientation has taught us along the way that we just simply forgot in the hype. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I absolutely think this, that the OSIM model is – 100% viable today with respect to any cloud, um, you know, approach. Now, if somebody thinks otherwise, uh, then, you know, I'm willing to have that discussion. But I don't know of too many cloud infrastructures that are, quote, dynamically reconfigurable from a business process point of view um, yet. Um, you know, you have some some models that are trending that away. But in general, I think that we're we're absolutely on target with respect to level seven in the OSIM. Now, later on, we might have to add a maturity uh, level that tracks with uh, a slightly different perspective uh, as we grow, you know, service integration and cloud computing and ser service-oriented architectures. I think we're um, closing in, and we have about nine minutes left, I think, in our scheduled time, Andres. Um, I think I've um, tried to um, 
pose some interesting questions for you as well as summarize some questions we were getting from the uh, from the attendees. Um, any any other things that you think would be relevant to bring up that we haven't covered? Um, hmm, relevant things that we spot. haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's go through the questions. I think uh, you know here. Is there anything that we missed? Um, There's a question about. Um, I just came down to the bottom of my list here about. Um, you know, in the process of going through an assessment, you're going to be identifying relationships between different elements within the assessment model. And uh, have we looked at using, say, semantic? Uh, model? Yeah, right. We have a semantic model uh, for SOA uh, that Chris can certainly hype up here. Yeah. And the SOA reference architecture actually does exactly that. It shows uh, interrelationships between architectural building blocks uh, at each of the layers of the SOA RA. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I do think that, you know, the SOA RA will be a fantastic boon uh, for us with respect to OSIM because you'll be able to actually kind of make some inferences about um, ABVs that are necessary at certain maturity levels for you to, re, you, know, re, you know, achieve your um, desired business outcomes and, you know, w the logical architecture that you'll need to be able to support. And ultimately, you know, that'll help you inform your physical implementation. So, you know, what 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 infrastructure do you need? What products do you need? What platform do you need? And we really believe that, you know, this discussion of cloud computing is really more of a platform discussion. Um, you know, and that's our perspective, certainly within IBM, and that is that we're seeing SOA become a new operating platform. And, um, you know, this whole uh, trend towards, you know, or the previous past trend of trying to select and integrate, you know, different components of a service uh, operations environment and trying to build those up into a, uh, an operational capability that lets you offer services is probably going to die in the vine here soon as companies begin to offer service platforms instead of, you know, individual products. So, you know, you'll, you'll be able to buy a service platform from IBM, a service platform from other companies. Uh, and we won't be in the uh, uh, we won't necessarily have to worry about you know finding uh, the right service registry and um, repository or finding the right you know um, uh, security product to manage web service security for us because it'll all be built in together and we'll really be talking more about what components do we turn on and what are necessary to offer a particular service. Right seems to be the direction we're heading in the industry. So just to uh, just to break in there and, and, and clarify specifically um, what Andras was referring to when he, he started there was the open group SOA ontology, which is a formal ontology for SOA um, expressed in OWL, um, though we've also tried to add uh, explanations and examples in, in English and indeed in UML. Um, so, yes, there is a, a formal ontology there which we believe the uh, RA and the, the OSM are consistent with. Yep, and there's work going on in other consortia um, and, and uh, relationships with other companies that, you know, across the industry, you know, with IBM and other companies to actually implement um, models that track uh, to these, uh, to SOARA and to the ontology work that we've done. Okay, um, so we have five minutes left, Andres. We want to scan through the uh, Q&A panel there, and uh, let's see what I missed. Well, there's uh, another, another one just come in. Um, did, did we talk about the use of the OSIM? There was a question earlier uh, about the delivering value at the earlier levels, uh, maturity levels, as well as the, um, the later ones. Right. And, and, and the fact that the OSIM covers a, uh, a broad spectrum of maturity, uh, we maybe tend to see dynamic reconfiguration as, as, as the most technically interesting thing, but uh, perhaps there's value um, at the early maturity levels also that we could uh, talk about. Yeah, well, i got to tell you what, uh, the most you know value that a, a corporation realizes when implementing service 
integration across their portfolio um, is between level three and level five. Why is that? Because of the lifespan of a business process, uh, you know, isn't isn't tens of years or isn't even you know maybe three or four years anymore. It could be as as little as months. And so there's really no you know value or return on investment um, to making some business processes um, highly highly mature um, services because they're they have a very short span of value. Um, that said, there are probably some infrastructure capabilities uh, that would allow you to do things like dynamically provide feedback as to, you know, what products individuals are ordering uh, and, and repopulate your inventory and so on and so forth that certainly would qualify as a dynamically reconfigurable service. But you're probably only going to have a few level 7 services and a whole lot of level four, five, and, and, and six. Okay. So, uh, yes, we'll be talking about three to five as being where they're being the most value is, uh, but there's still probably value even at level one. Um, oh, yeah. Like, like we said, Chris, you know, most of the, you know, organizations these days are, you know, you're, you're, you're consolidating organizationally, your, you know, M&A is still, a, a significant business focus. I mean, look at T-Mobile and AT&T. That's going to be a huge M&A, you know, transformation effort that's going to have to happen there. Um, many other companies, you know, including, you know, my own, um, going through that process. And you really have to let, look at these IT systems from a data perspective. And as you do, um, they're going to, you're going to have to establish uh, a, uh, a service foundation layer uh and that's going to mean you're going to have to, you know, take the silo, you know, break apart the components, integrate, you know, make them integrated, and uh, ex externalize them as services to be able to, uh, to utilize them. Or you, you know, basically deprecate some of them in lieu of uh, some other services, right? But regardless, you have to look at that as service foundation levels. Okay, so um, I think uh, as as we are drawing towards the end of the hour, that's possibly uh, a very good uh, note to end on. Um, OSIM is all about assessing maturity, um, and it's a complete graduated scale that enables you to assess your service integration maturity um, from from from, if you like, the um, the, 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 the beginnings of, of thoughts about SOA right through to, to a, a, a very technically um, a technically advanced and, uh, and, and well developed solution. Um, so the OSIM, I believe, is of, of, of potentially great value, and it's been great that uh, Andras and Dan have been here to help people uh, gain some of that value by asking questions uh, and I'd like to thank Andras very much for um, the depth and extent of the answers that he's given to those questions um, and I'd also like to ask Dan, uh, sorry, I'd like to thank Dan very much first of all for um, sharing with us his questions as to um, how the OSIM should be deployed uh, and what it's all about, uh, and also for doing such a great job of uh, looking at the questions that have come in from uh, people on the web uh, and, uh, and putting them to Andras. So Andras and Dan, thanks very much indeed um, for your uh, participation in this webinar, and thanks indeed to everyone who has uh, attended the webinar um, and has asked questions or indeed has simply participated and, and gained value from it. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Thank you. You're welcome.